Hello, everyone, and welcome to part three of Atlas series of fundamentals of weathering webinars. Today's topic is on laboratory weathering, and my name is Oliver Rahäuser, and I will be your presenter today. This event will last approximately one hour, and uh, I expect to get through the presentation in about 55 minutes or so, and so we will leave the last five minutes open to, to answer your questions. Just some housekeeping uh, before we start. Uh, please note that everyone has been muted on this webinar, but of course you can type in any question you like by using the questions button. You have a go to webinar control panel where you see the menu question, type on it and, and enter your question and we will answer that uh, at the end of this webinar. Should I not be able to answer your question, we will follow up with you uh, via your email. I will get together with my colleagues and other experts and, and we we'll follow up with you by email. Also no need to worry about uh, taking detailed notes as always we will provide you a link to download a PDF copy of this presentation today, shortly after the webinar. And uh, after the presentation, um, please take some minutes time and, and provide us your feedback so we can further fine tune our presentations to better meet your needs. So there's a short feedback survey coming after the webinar as well. Here's a picture of me. My educational background is chemistry and material science. This is quite useful for, for our topics here at Atlas, all around product durability testing. Additionally, you find my email address, oliver.rahäuser.ametech.com. Don't hesitate to contact me in case of any instrument or application related question. No? So now let's see uh, what's in for you today. Um, everything today is marked in red. We are at part three, laboratory weathering today. Some basic requirements of the weathering devices. And then you see the whole list of different light sources. Those are the light sources that differentiate the different chamber types of laboratory weathering devices. What we want to show you here is really that though we are here at part three, there is a total set of six fundamentals of weathering webinars, independent seminars that nicely fit together. The prior part one is laying out the basics of weathering, the important factors. Part two is about natural weathering techniques, both are uh, really nicely supporting uh, to better understand laboratory weathering. And uh, when you have seen all these fundamental first details, we uh, show you test methods and the basic standards which are commonly used in, in, in weathering testing, outdoor and indoor. We give you deeper knowledge about acceleration in part five and then finally uh, we show you how to determine correlation using common statistical tools, which are quite useful. Well, back to our agenda about laboratory weathering. And uh, let me briefly introduce um, Atlas just with two slides so you better know what we are doing. At Atlas, um, probably best described uh, what we are doing is we test everything under the sun. We help you to make better products in shorter time by offering you testing solutions, durability testing solutions with a focus on shortest test duration, but also on precision. Our goal is really to enable every product development team to make the best material choice for a new product within shortest possible time and also to test complete products uh, within shortest possible time. Every test takes you further and uh, that's a little bit uh, my credo. 
here you see the four cornerstones of Atlas and top left, uh, you see that we are providing probably one of the most comprehensive line of artificial accelerated weathering instruments, xenon instruments, UV type instruments, corrosion instruments. Those are the top three, all in different sizes. Top right, uh, you see we offer both outdoor and laboratory weathering services. So you can so you can send us your samples and we test them for you. Bottom left is, uh, you see the Atlas has a special department for customized systems. It's really a dedicated team. One is producing high-speed lighting for crash test photography, photographers. And another more closely related to weathering is custom solar simulators in kind of mid size to extra large size. Yeah? A typical application is metal halide based solar simulators inside a complete drive-in test chamber. Um, so the automotive industry uh, does a lot of testing inside component uh, test chambers, product test chambers or full vehicle test chambers. Standards and client education. This is uh, our fourth cornerstone. We are heavily engaged in standardization of weathering test methods or designing customized test methods in-house for you. And additionally, what we are doing right now, we call client education means training you either online or in person at different locations in the world every year, every month. So that was the brief introduction about Atlas. Let's go back to our topic today. The intention of any laboratory accelerated weathering instrument is really to deliver the same factors of weathering to which materials are exposed in outdoor conditions or in indoor conditions. That means uh, the goal is really to bring in those stress conditions from outdoor in into your laboratory equipment as, as good as possible. As you may have learned from previous presentation, this means we're bringing um, inside heat, light, meaning radiation and moisture. And regarding the moisture, this can be either through humidity, water spray or water condensation uh, methods. Furthermore, the instrument can control each of the, these factors independently. So from a wide range of, of, of irradiance levels, humidity levels, and temperature levels. So there are many different types and variations of, of testing devices and uh, how well they simulate those stress levels. Um, this can be a little bit different and that's really the, the core of today. What's also important uh, really when you look at a realistic laboratory weathering uh, test device is the correlation that uh, really your instruments correlate well to the natural exposures. By correlation, we mean how well the laboratory test can really provide the same physical or appearance changes as observed through natural weathering. So same stress, con stress conditions uh, then leading to the same macroscopic changes. The relevance uh, also important is that we induce the same degradation pathways. Uh, that really the same degradation mechanisms uh, are, are ongoing and happening. Um, and this is of course helping uh, that you really get good correlation. And acceleration, <clears throat> as I said in my introduction, uh, we always focus on, on really test methods that deliver um, test results after shortest possible time. And uh, so that's uh, well, what we have in a separate 
um, webinar, as you see, all the different ways of acceleration. But what's typically done in test methods, just as an introduction, is that they work on realistic maximum levels for irradiance, temperature, and moisture, and also uh, on time compression. So neglect the night cycles, only do short versions of, of, of dark periods so that we have a lot of radiation time, which is typically dominant and providing acceleration. Precision is, uh, is the last uh, comment. We want to have repeatable and reproducible test re results. And typically, the precision is how, how narrow are the fluctuation plus minus of, of all the independent control test parameters. And uh, at Atlas, we focus really to keep those tolerances very narrow. We also focus on uniformity of all stress parameters inside the test chamber, that this is um, as high as possible at every location in the test chamber, and uh, so that you really have reliable and repeatable test results. Major parameter, parameters for artificial weathering, we look here at the graphic of a modern xenon arc weathering instruments, such as the Atlas CI series models, and uh, number one, and artificial weathering instruments is, is the radiance uh, control. So this is the intensity of the radiation emitted and the spectral power distribution for the irradiance. This is defined by different optical filters. For example, a daylight filter will deliver spectral irradiance similar to natural outdoor sunlight a window glass filter on the other side will deliver spectral irradiance similar to natural sunlight behind window glass, like at home. Yeah. And so there are different optical filters you, you can install in your instrument to get the spectral irradiance distribution right. What we also do, we measure sample surface temperature with a kind of a reference black standard. Uh, sensor that is kind of delivering uh, a reading of the maximum realistic temperature like like dark samples so this is how we kind of control the upper level of the temperature um, of your specimens and the test chamber temperature is really the air temperature which is controlled uh, in in the inside the instrument typically in the range of ambient up to 60, 70 degrees C. Relative humidity, every really more advanced weathering instrument has a humidifier. This means uh, we manage the humidity and temperature and feed that into, into the test chamber, typically in the range of 10%, very dry like deserts, up to 100%. Um, uh, for for really tropical climates or when, when we let it rain. This is the next point. The cycles um, you can program either light and dark phases. The dark phases are sometimes neglected when they can also be very useful to provide some relaxation time uh, for, for, for all the light induced excited states you produce and also a very important dry and wet phases so you program how long you want to have light phases with or without rain and how long you want to have uh, pure rain phases for example in the dark yeah calibration of the Measuring sensors, of course, is also key. The, otherwise, you, you have no track on, on the precision of your instrument. So typical calibration routines are every six months. A special accessory for some uh, weathering testers are chillers, air chillers. 
cooling uh, air units so you can really test at ambient temperatures even under high irradiance levels or at sub ambient temperatures around down to plus 15 degrees C. So this doesn't mean frost cycles, uh, but some sub ambient temperatures, which can really give already a lot of mechanical stress when you're typically think about maybe 35, 40 degrees air chamber, when you then jump into a cycle of 15 degrees C air, air temperature. And then this is a big difference. And so you can do some cycling uh, well, with additional chillers, or you simply have thermal sensitive materials which would melt or de degrade too uh, fast uh, alone through thermal effects. Then you also add a chiller. The cosmetic and the pharmaceutical industry, for example, is typically uh, adding a chiller to, to simply study the photostability effect and exclude or minimize the thermal effect. In our slide here, we see that solar radiation is not a constant. It varies on both short and long-term scales, different times of the day, different seasons, different climatic or atmospheric conditions. And even elevation will have an effect on the spectral power distribution. So the graphic shows that uh, there's a reference spectrum uh, which we are using. This has the reference to the CIE number 85, table four. There you get this spectral power distribution for the UV, for the visible and the IR. So there is a reference uh, sun that specifies typically the intensity between 295 to 3000 nanometer, about 1000 watts per square meter are in this total spectrum, there are about 1000 watts per square meter. When we just look from the UV to the visible, then you have around 550 watts, but it's still the same spectrum we are talking. UV radiation, this part here, the 6.8% of the global spectrum, this includes about 60 watts per square meter. Or if we even go down into a single wavelength of 340 nanometer, then you have an energy of 0.51 watts per square meter, rough. And uh, why am I telling you all this stuff? Because weathering instruments typically have uh, irradiance sensors that either measure the UV and control the UV level, like these 60 watts, or they sometimes have narrowband sensors controlling then the spectrum at 0.51. But uh, they're all doing the same job. It's just different numbers because um, they reference a different wavelength range. And you, you need to know that. For example, sun tests are often controlled at 300 to 800. So they look at UV plus visible radiation. That's the equivalent of 550 watts to 60 watts. So in a UV controlled instrument would control 60 watts, the sun tests 550 watts doing exactly the same job just with different light sensors. That's the story here uh, behind to, to explain a little bit the different light sensors and, and the energies of, of the reference. So let's come to the five uh, different light sources uh, typically used in weathering instruments. And uh, there is Xenon. This is a kind of a, dominant light source because it's very stable UV, it has nice visible light and also the IR portions of, of natural sunlight. There's fluorescent UV, these are these UV bulbs. Um, they have typically only a kind of a peak in, in, in the UV and the nice cut on like the sun. And, uh, but there is hardly long wavelength UV and no visible NIR. Carbon arc, 
has some very overshooting peaks here in, in the long wave UV and they also exceed in the short wavelength typically. And metal halide, the green curve, it's also quite close, but it has less stable UV control um, compared to xenon. And mercury vapor lamps, uh, they are used in the CPAP, they have distinct, um, distinct curves. So um, this is maybe really a little bit a busy slide, but uh, the magenta squares, this is the reference sun, which you should hit as good as possible. Yeah. And we see, although that filtered xenon has some peaks here in the, in, in the visible range and some spikes in, in, uh, in the IR range, it's not shown here, this is, probably the best uh, match to natural sunlight. When you have a daylight filter with xenon or a window glass filter um, with, with xenon. It's again a kind of a, of, of a repetition. We don't need that. Another way really to categorize uh, the laboratory weathering instrument is by its test chamber design. And uh, you see there are basically three different designs. And uh, one is static horizontal. You simply put your specimens uh, onto the test table and have light sources and optical filters on top. And you try to best really fill um, with light, uh, the, the, the complete test area really homogeneously. That when you are control, for example, 60 watt, that you have 60 watts here, here, and here, and also in the corners. And that's a little bit um, more difficult in these static test chambers to achieve. Like when you have a centered light source uh, and have a rotating rack. The, those rotating rack machines typically have a better homogeneity from top, middle, bottom, um, and everywhere in the chamber regarding the irradiance level, the temperature, and the moisture as well. And simply because everything is moving and, and, and really mixed regarding temperature and moisture, and the irradiance is, is optimized uh, regarding lamp length and, and the distance to the lamp that everything is really ideal. Fluorescent type chambers, they have a smart test up which provides you really a lot of test space where when you have these staggered or stacked uh, UV bulbs and then there's a test chamber door where which you can really fill up completely with test specimens. And uh, that, that gives you a lot of test area with a rather, rather simple arrangement. And uh, we, will, so we will see more later on. The Xenonarc instruments, um, we really start with them because they are the most important radiation source used in weathering. And there are two different lamp types. There are air-cooled xenon lamps, which are typically lower power lamps for smaller instruments to mid-size instruments. And there are water-cooled xenon arc lamps for the larger test chambers like CI4400, CI5000, they can carry about 75 to more than 100 samples on the rack. So they are really quite extra large for, for, for weathering testing per purposes. And uh, well, the, uh, the air-cooled lamps are inside the sun test and, and the xeno test um, um, instruments. Maybe one note that uh, the type of cooling itself is really not having really a major influence on the spectral power distribution. Um, this is just different technology. What really is important uh, is shown here. If we don't put any optical filters 
inside Xenon ARC instrument, you have a disaster. Yeah, you have a lot of spikes in the IR and visible range. You have a very high overshoot up to 250 nanometers. You're producing UVC radiation with an unfiltered Xenon ARC lamp. So what you need to do is, and here is here's uh, just a reference sun so that you see all these deviations. When we apply the optical filter, everything becomes nice. And uh, maybe a comment, the optical filters, of course, according to standard, and each standard typically specifies in detail how your optical filter should perform regarding the transmission and the final spectral output. So here you see um, minimum and maximum deviation from the reference sun for a daylight filter, for example. And uh, all these filters, what you see here, the daylight filter in, in, in blue nicely matches the sun because it fulfills this uh, minimum maximum tolerances as provided by the standard and the reference sun. And the same is true for indoor daylight. The green squares are the reference sun through window glass, and the yellow curve is the xenon. And uh, you will always see the xenon cations in the short wavelength, if it's daylight or indoor daylight, um, is excellent. And that's why typically the correlation is, uh, is very high because we have a very, very good match in the critical wavelengths, in the short wavelengths, and uh, also nice visible parts um, to get the temperatures right of different colored samples. Let's move on um, a little bit uh, with this image, what we, what we are showing you. Here is the light rod and, and the sensor that controls the irradiance level inside a CI machine. Uh, looks directly at, at, at the lamp. And again, this can be a UV light sensor for 300 to 400 nanometers. It can be a narrow band light sensor like for 340 nanometer as, as shown you earlier. And, uh, well, that's it. And uh, you see the water-cooled lamp, which has two filters, an outdoor, an outdoor filter and an inner filter. And between those filters, there's this water cooling going on. So that's why you see this, this huge arrangement around the lamp and the lamp connectors. What you also see is the black panel sensor and uh, the spray does back spray and here's a front spray uh, front spray rod. So that's also typical for, for weathering instruments that they have two water spray options, front, the specimen spray and back spray. And uh, the back spray is really a little bit odd. This is from an automotive standard written by the SAE uh, organization. Um, they thought it useful to also wet the samples for, for, from the back, but this is this is quite questionable. The chamber air and humidity sensor, by standard requirement, must be shielded from from the light source. So this is typically uh, right at the exit air of uh, of the test chamber positioned or shielded. Uh, really from the light that there is no light impact uh, um, giving uh, impacting impacting the readings of the chamber air temperature and the humidity. What you see here is well when when we have a xenon lamp here in this in the center, this is typically a light beam like this to that. So, and, and that, so this is how you can really design your rack 
where you position the samples on the top, in the middle or on the bottom. And what you see with the red curve, this is the irradiance level where it's all the same. And this is how we design our sample racks that they follow as close as possible this, this red curve. And this, is, this red curve is available for each instrument and uh, so we know exactly what is the ideal rec design for irradiance uniformity. And as explained earlier, the uniformity of irradiance is very important to ATLAS and uh, we always try to get it to, to the optimum so that you don't have any differences between the top, middle, or the bottom samples. That's that's the key. That this is really a benefit then and an advantage that you don't have to manually reposition samples inside a rotating rack machine. That's typically only uh, important when you have these static um, sun test, flatbed testers, where it's really hard to reach into the corners and into the sides of, uh, of the test area. Um, that's why it's uh, quite useful to do manual reposition inside a flatbed, but the rotating rack chambers, they don't require that. Something about uh, the UV cut-on, uh, which also talks about the precision of, of Xenonarc instruments. And uh, I tell you a little bit the story about uh, the times when extended UV filters came up for extra acceleration. They are full of UVC and short wavelength UVB um, radiation because uh, the thinking, the thought was um, that a lot of short wavelength um, will provide us a short test. The knowledge today is that it produces also a lot of correlation mismatches yeah, or correlation problems because you, you can trigger also some other pathways than nature and uh, sometimes um, accelerate into the wrong way, so to say. The daylight Boro Boro is a kind of an outdated filter. You see that uh, it still has an excess of, of short wavelength and kind of the, really the standard today is right light. And uh, this really has a kind of a successful path now, really in automotive testing, in photovoltaic testing, and, and, and other test methods, because you see it really perfectly matches uh, the natural sunlight. And uh, when you look at the blue curve. So this is a, a little bit the development uh, in, in, in a short time frame, what we, what we see here over the past 15, 20 years. And really starting with shorter wavelengths, more mismatch to, to, to the natural sunlight. And since a couple of years, about 10 years now, we really have a, a great filter for, for, for xenon instruments. This is, this is the right light yeah, for simulating outdoor daylight. And uh, here are more filters and you see which standards are, are used for with these uh, other type of filters. We don't have to go through that. The same is uh, valid for air-cooled xenon instruments like the Xenotest. Uh, there are different types of optical filters um, simply for historic reasons and historic standard reasons. And uh, we're currently working on uh, to release also a right light filter for, for our Xenotest instruments, uh, which is probably coming soon. The difference um, between air-cooled and water-cooled instrument, I said, is, is the lamp type, but it's also the way of how we measure um, the irradiance. Irradiance is measured in air-cooled instruments really on the sample rack, uh, which is which is quite useful, we think, 
to, to really measure exactly the irradians where your samples are positioned. And these are typically combined sensors that have an eye for, for the irradians and that have either a black panel or a black standard sensor um, underneath. And I just mentioned it, uh, black panel and black standard, there is a big difference because black panel sensors are here on the left. They don't have any thermal insulation on the back. They have the full airflow behind, like from, from your chamber air fans. And so they are typically reading cooler, a little bit cooler black panel temperatures compared to when they have a P, uh, PVDF uh, polymer insulation plate on the, on the back. They read a little bit hotter temperatures. Although they have the same black surface, they can differ in temperature because they have a different design. The one is insulated. This is the BST and uh, the uninsulated black panel sensor typically used for American test uh, methods is uninsulated. On the axis, we, x axis, we have the increasing irradiance range, and you see that the difference between the squares, the insulated, and the uninsulated are the, are the dots here, becomes bigger and bigger. It's at moderate irradiance levels, maybe three, four degrees C, 60 watt, easily five. Beyond 60 watt, maybe seven up to 10 degrees C difference. Um, so uh, that's my reminder. Be very careful to have the correct black panel sensor installed. Check your test method if you need an insulated or an uninsulated black panel sensor because they really have different readings and when we talk about typically five degrees difference that's a lot in weathering testing when you maybe remember that about 10 degrees can typically already double the degradation speed five degrees c is really a significant difference um, if you have really five degrees hotter temperatures than required by the standard, you already have a, a really a, a much higher ex uh, acceleration compared to uh, the other type of, of black panel sensor control. And when you want to compare the results from, from two different locations, maybe your German and your American colleagues, want to run the same test method and they don't see the same test results, that can be due to a different uh, black panel temperature sensor in one of those instruments. So make sure you get the black panel temperature right for whatever test you, uh, you intend to run. Some more about the Xenon instruments, they can replicate uh, really the temperature effects properly because they have the visible and the IR radiation included. And visible um, radiation is picked up differently by white specimens, yellow, red. The darker they become, the more visible light they, they absorb and the hotter they become. And the difference between a black and a white samples can easily be 20 degrees C. And uh, when you have different colored specimens, you really should put them into a xenon instrument to really have the different thermal effects from their color. And uh, the xenon instruments do that. Uh, you see that at different irradiance levels, uh, the white and the black, that's typically, you know, around 20 degrees C, 15 to 20 degrees C. So Xenon Arc instrument can reproduce those effects. And uh, we will see that the UV testers cannot. 
we can quickly go through the benchtop uh, instruments. The benchtop instruments, they have nice solar simulators inside and nice temperature controls, but uh, typically they don't have humidifiers. So you have an instrument without humidity control. This is oftentimes good enough, I, I would say, but not for everything. Yeah, when, when you go to very sensitive materials, like like thin materials or printing inks and labels and stuff, um, they react to humidity quite uh, strongly. So the you should you should respect that how far you can get with with, with the benchtop instruments. One large flatbed has a humidifier underneath the XXL plus. So this is kind of a fully functional. Weathering, weathering tester with a little bit the deficiency that you have to manually rotate your, your samples inside because you cannot reach really well inside the corners. You typically have a, a uniformity of plus minus 10% for, for irradiance and temperature maybe a little bit lower, around 7% we can achieve with the, uh, with the XXL plus. But that's typically the limitation. And rotating rack instruments, um, they have uniformity of plus minus 3%, yeah, something like that. So they are much better. Typical standards, you have a list here. And uh, this is just for, for your information. And uh, we can jump now into the fluorescent UV devices. Fluorescent UV devices said they have quite simple designs. Uh, they use UV fluorescent bulbs and no filters. So they simply rely on the spectrum, um, what these bulbs provide. And you can install three different lamp types, a UVB313, a UVA340, or a UVA351. And I and I'll show you in a, in a minute what, what's their spectral difference. They have also irradiance control, like panel temperature controls. You can have water spray functions, and they do the, the moisture via condensation in the dark cycles quite, quite nicely. And you can also program light and dark cycles, like inside xenon instruments. But here comes the major difference. When you install a UVB313 lamp, you have a very aggressive spectrum. Some standards still request for that spectrum. Although we say it's, it's unnatural and typically providing low correlation to your natural comparisons. And uh, the UVA340 is the green curve. This has a very nice match to natural sunlight in the short wavelength and the first part of the UVA. And the second part of the UVA is almost missing. And then just two peaks in the visible, this is nothing. So what you do is when you have materials that are sensitive in this long wavelength UVA range, you underexpose, you underestimate the, de the real degradation occurring in nature because nature is harsher uh, in this UVA range here. The UVA351 is kind of the window glass type equivalent to xenon. You see the wavelength shifts a little bit to longer wavelengths, cuts out the UVB like, like a window glass filter uh, would do for xenon. You have the same effect, however, no long wavelength UVA. We know natural sunlight behind window glass also has the same amount of long wavelength UVA. That doesn't get any bit of filtering um, through window glass. So you're also underexposing, you're underestimating your test results um, with, this UV, uh, with this UV testers, which have a nice capacity and they have a nice price, but they can provide you misleading 
underestimates of, of, of your degradation you see in the tester compared to real world. So you have to make also really real world um, exposures and compare them very well to, to see if, if the UV tester provides good enough uh, lab testing results or not. And as mentioned before, um, the UV fluorescent devices, um, they have more or less really the same temperature um, for, for, for black or red samples. This is typically only, only, only a few temperature degrees C difference. So they have different temperature control, but uh, they're more or less on the same uh, surface temperature level, like you see here. For, sorry, I was here. This is this is Florida. Florida so natural exposures. The xenon arc instruments which follow the natural exposures, and here this is this narrow temperature window produced inside a UV fluorescent device for different colored specimens. They're almost all the same. Some test standards. These UV testers really come from the world of paints and varnishes and coatings. That's where they are predominantly used. There's also plastic standard, the option number three in ISO 4892-2. And uh, well, that's you see the, the list of, of test standards is already heavily reduced compared to Xenon. Carbon arc is kind of an outdated technology and we don't have to talk about the 1915s or 30s and 27s. Um, it's just to be complete because there have been some modernized uh, carbon arc devices which provide kind of a okay spectrum with this sunshine carbon arc uh, versions of the latest technology. This is this green and this blue curves. And you see how they match to the natural sunlight. There are still some, some great mismatches left in, in the UVA. And they also produce some, some small excesses in, in the UVB level. So they're really hardly used apart from Japan. India and the UK. So there are some countries that still have trust uh, in this technology and it's still described in the current standard ISO 4892-2 for plastics with the option number four for carbon arc or coatings testing. Option number four explains the carbon arc. And uh, so there are it's it's still in use, although it's very, very old technology, I would say. A specialist for mechanical studies and photoaging studies is the CPOP instrument. And it was really invented by some very smart uh, French people and researchers of the CNAP Institute, the Centre National d'Evaluation de Photoprotection. And uh, this is their institute, and they also gave the instrument the name, the CPAP, Service de Photo. Oh, well, it's more accelerate the polymers. So they want to really study polymers. And uh, giving this distinct peaks, how they trigger the excited states of each polymer, and then really study the photochemical pathways with extra um, chemical analytics and so on. This is not really weathering. Um, it's really doing research on, on, on polymers, I would say. Typical test methods you have here. So it has been standardized for plastics. Yeah. And uh, you see also an automotive OEM like Renault has uh, developed its own test method. So they are also using it uh, to, to study their materials, what they use out, uh, um, outside their cars. And, uh, but this is kind of, of an 
of a specialty, I would say, this Renault test method using the CPAP. They have plenty of xenon testers um, to do other testing and other material qualification. Brings me to the last light source, which is metal halide global technology. It's this lamp type, a metal halide lamp, put inside a big um, luminaire with reflectors and also optical filters. You need an optical daylight filter to, uh, to fine tune the spectrum and, and get the cut on, get the cut on right. It's very effective. It's more effective uh, than xenon, uh, about three times as effective. So you get a lot of useful light for, for, for the electrical power you feed in, in, into the lamp. But the, the lamp aging um, is, is, is rather fast. So you have not that stable and controllable UV like like in xenon instruments but it's very good for 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 solar heat load effects because the visible light and the ir they are even more realistic like like with xenon so everything that depends with heating up samples and studying the solar heat load in a realistic way this is done then in the so called solar environmental chambers where you typically test full products. Those are not for studying uh, the degradation and how and, and the durability and lifetime. Uh, those are really used to, to do realistic thermal stress and, and look at the performance and the expansion and contraction uh, of complete products made of different materials. So here is again the spectrum. You see the green curve, optical filtered metal halide has some overshoots in the UVA, sometimes a little bit deficient of the UVB when the lamp ages quickly, but uh, the visible and in particular the IR that provides these heating, the solar heat load, this is extremely well done with metal halide. So you can study thermal effects um, from the sun very nicely. And those thermal effects are, are tested inside full cars when you wanna get the air conditioning right and really know how much air conditioning you need when the, when the sun is really on realistic peaks and, and so on. So that's where, where this MHG-based solar simulators come in. That's very typical application, all outside of, of, of weathering. This is not weathering testing. This is really performance testing and also testing really kind of extreme temperatures, extreme realistic temperatures and the effects on the majorly electronics in the, inside a car. Also effects on planes, this is then really the solar effect on the avionics really is everything fully functional when the when they get really extreme thermal load far from the sun so we are not checking the durability of the coating here uh, we're really checking the functionality of this jet where which which can really be driven inside this test chamber um, completely under full load and they, they can simulate all the flights, the conditions they need. Here you see the test methods for, for metal halide based uh, testing. And you see this is big in the automotive industry, big in the military industry, big in the electronics and the PV module testing. And here, pure electronic equipment. So it's basically three fields where they, where, where they do really performance tests, how durable are, 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 are these photovoltaic panels under complete solar load and how much electrical power do they produce? And the same for, for this external 
pieces of electronics. And of course, it will become more and more with all these autonomous driving robotics go around your your front yard or or doing harvesting in the fields and and so on. Well, um, maybe one quick comparison what we are what we have seen. This is these xenon testers. They really are excellent choices for material specifications to to qualify materials for components and products because they they have a very stable and super controlled uv and the component test chambers they they test the performance under realistic heat load yeah and they are typically applying then also sub ambient frost cycles they are fully climatic chambers with solar simulators on top and that's the difference. The one is material qualification and the other is component and product testing. And Atlas is doing the full the full level. There is some 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 overlapping in components. Uh, many people like to put components in a SunTest XXL for for example because the, they want to get the benefits of filtered xenon solar simulators in in inside uh, but then it's, uh, it's really a durability test, for example. Five technologies we have seen today. Most realistic simulation with filtered xenon, rotating rack and flatbed instruments. The UVA340 has a very realistic cut-on in the UVB. However, it's lacking the long wavelength UVA and the visible and the ion the mercury vapor are a specialty to study photochemical degradation pathways and the metal halide technology has some deficiencies in the in the uv control but excellent visible and excellent ir radiation for solar heat load testing so metal halide is also very effective uh, i told you so you can really build extra large test chambers uh, with those metal halide based uh, lights. You cannot produce them with xenon because you would need much too much xenon power, about three times compared to this metal halide uh, technology. There was my summary and uh, that was what we have learned today. Please see that the next uh, fundamentals of weathering topic is acceleration. Don't miss that. And if you want to really see how to do the best with your test results, don't miss the correlation webinar. You find a lot of recorded seminars uh, on our home, uh, on our website under the Knowledge Center. You find the recorded seminars. You find also a blog nowadays where we've gone live with a weathering block giving small pieces easy to read um, on really important topics or new topics the latest topics so it's it's also worth checking out the weathering block and there is more really like weathering summaries, uh, summaries or knowledge or registration about future seminars so you see the client education calendar where and how to register brings me to the question and answer uh, session uh, we don't have a lot of time left uh, today but let's see if i can quickly answer at least a couple of your questions and uh, i see it here Please do not say that 10 degrees increase doubles the rate. That is true in very few cases. And that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you go through our fundamentals uh, of weathering uh, part one, this will, will talk about that, how to really view that. 10 degree uh, C can, can mean even uh, quadruple the degradation rates. It's just a rule of thumb. And uh, that's really true, it's right. And uh, maybe also attend the acceleration webinar 
and uh, see how the temperature effect is really discussed in, in detail over there. I can only really recommend to join that acceleration webinar. It depends really on are you in the crystalline state, then the temperature effect is very minimal only. When you increase with 10 degrees C into the rubbery state, then it can it can mean a lot because then the diffusion rate is much, much faster for oxygen and uh, you will see a big difference. So it's, I think that's, that answers a little bit the question that, uh, and, and you're, you're right, we have to be careful with this rule of thumb to uh, what 10 degrees C temperature increase means. And let's see some more. No more questions today. Um, then we can finish on time, I would say. And uh, please don't hesitate. If, uh, if you need to digest a little bit the seminar and there are new questions or upcoming questions, just uh, write me an email and we follow up with you. I would say, the, that's it for today. Thanks again for joining our webinar. I hope I could provide at least some information valuable for your work today. Stay well and uh, hope we meet again. Bye-bye.